Welcome to the Force and Friction podcast, your go-to show for the latest RevOps strategies, discussions and interviews. Welcome to the Force and Friction Pathfinders podcast. And as part of the Nearbound series, in today's show, we welcome Justin Gray, the Managing Director at InRevenue Capital, based out of Scottsdale, Arizona. Welcome to the show, Justin. I appreciate you taking time out of our very busy schedule of yours. Hey, thank you. Great to be here. Awesome. So we always kick off on the Force and Friction podcast, Justin, uh, with the guest's one-liner origin story. And I was intrigued when I saw yours. You say, I'm a nobody from nowhere. I am what I am today because I've surrounded myself with great people. Tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, I mean, the the backstory kind of is what it sounds like there. I'm from a very small town. I'm from a lower middle class family. I did not go to great universities. I don't have a great degree or anything of that nature. Like I've been fortunate in my life to meet a number of really great individuals and kind of leverage that concept to meet more great people, right? Like that's kind of what I've learned in in my life, which is like, you have to be proactive about forming relationships and, you know, give to get, which is a big kind of mantra that, that we serve up. Like you have to provide value to folks, like lead with that, lead with that kind of hyper value concept. And then ultimately, you're not doing that because things will come back, but they will come back. Um, and I think, you know, again, that's what I've seen time and time again. Yeah. And I think one of the things that I've done, I mean, nearly 30 years in business myself, Justin, I started in October 1994 and various iterations and exits and things like that beyond that. But one thing that I've always found it is getting to that next level, you know, and then meeting those people. Like you said, use the word leverage those connections and to to get Mm -hmm. into more of those people. Um, People getting started today, you know, outside of just being helpful. Is there anything else that you would sort of throw at them to say, you know, to you may be operating at this connection level or this network level. You know, you want to hit this network level and, you know, whether it's hierarchical or higher or lower or sideways, it doesn't matter. You know, what are they doing? Is it just sort of being consistent or helpful or is there another sort of trick that you sort of can give to get them into that next level platform? Yeah, I mean, I, I truly think it's about like trying to punch above your weight class and everything that you do. And the thing that I've discovered is like people are incredibly generous with their time, like folks that. You know, you may be like people are just hesitant to reach out to, to successful people, I find. And like, I, I also find those are the individuals that like are the most generous with their time and are willing to to, you know, sit down with you for 15, 30 minutes, whatever it happens to be, as long as you're intentional about the use of that that time. Like, hey, I'm really, you know, I'm trying to start a business like would, would you, will you review my pitch deck? You know, I'm, I'm thinking about going into this space like you've done that before. Can you give me some advice, right? Like just, you, you have to spend the time to do that research and and understand like why you'd want to speak to someone. But like, I find there's just this big natural barrier on, you know, oh, I don't think they're going to give me their time, so on and so forth. Like I find vastly more often than not that they will, but you know, you have to also pay that off with, you know, this is squarely what I need from you. Like, can you help me? And, 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 and people will kind of connect those dots for you. Yeah, hundred percent. And we mentioned the nearbound and the Jared Follow. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment or two. Uh, but I spoke with Bob in Napolitani, um, the ex um, Salesforce uh, App Exchange guy, yep. and he said when Jared reached out to him, he saw something in Jared, and it was very intentional. So that resonates. And then obviously Bobby speaks to Jared, and then you know various things like that. And I'm sure that mm-hmm. that story is repeated through many of the conversations I've had through this nearbound series. So awesome advice. Thanks for that. Um, If you're not quite familiar with uh, Justin and his background professionally, uh, a couple of bits uh, that uh, Justin will talk a little bit around and and expand on, but he's a five times uh, entrepreneur uh, award winner, um, made a career out of launching and scaling businesses. He's got a wide, diverse range of interests. And if it shows you, you know, you don't have to just be packed into one area like SaaS or tech, although, you know, whatever. Um, He owns with his father an 130 acre USDA certified organic hemp farm in rural Missouri. Um, Justin, that's that's slightly away from VC and, and go to market type of thing to just a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. And he started Angel Investing to make strategic investments. Um, he's a limited fund uh, partner in Stage Two Capital, um, Atlas, and, and Prospect. Um, he also hosts the uh, hosts the Cheat Code podcast with Josh Wagner. Um, and I believe you've also got a Cheat Code book coming out to, uh, soon, Josh. Uh, so do. Just, when, when is that uh, ready uh, to be launched with Josh? Yeah, so Wiley is publishing that. We're launching it in January. It's, it's like awesome. second week in January. Yeah, 2025. 
And if you want any of these, um, if you want any of these links, we'll put these into the show notes and you can get those at forceandfrictionpodcast.com. Um, so I've got to ask um, Justin, uh, hemp, organic hemp farm in rural Missouri. Uh, how did that come out? Is that is that the small town where you were originally from and you just happened to be inside of that? Or is that something, just an opportunity that presented itself that you thought, hey, I'm going to, you know, take a, take a chance on that? So it's the small town where my parents are originally from. I'm actually born and raised in Arizona, which I, I firmly believe there are only five of us uh, that meet that category. But so, you know, like my parents moved to, to Arizona in 71, which, you know, the small town I'm from, like it's basically the Wild West at, at that time. So I think that's the spirit that I, I have inherited from from my family. Like my father's an entrepreneur as well, has owned his own business in construction and so on. And so like that land, you know, has been in their, their you know, our family for, for years and years and years. I actually bought it from them in 21. But prior to that, had just kind of been sitting there. We were leasing it out for farming and so on. And when the construction industry kind of went through a major dip in, in uh, 2008, uh, started talking and saying like, hey, why don't we do something with this, which would just be, you know, fun. Like, I, I truly believe like working with your hands and like manual labor and the ability to see something, you know, start and finish in the same day is just so completely contrarian to what normally happens in SaaS and uh, feels really good. And so we kind of met on that concept and then transferred, uh, spent three years certifying that land as organic. And then when hemp became legal in a number of states, including Missouri, um, in 2019, uh, we started that the, the process of converting a portion of that uh, to hemp farming. And so, awesome. you know, that, that's kind of what it remains as today. Yeah, but so diversity, never say no and, you know, get outside of your swim lanes. That's awesome. I, I, I hate I hate any day that looks the same as the former. And so, like, that's my fundamental mission and and a big reason it, it, why we're doing what we are at, at In Revenue and in, in the VC space is, you know, I love that variability. I love that the excitement that it brings. And, and certainly that that translates to the um, diverse range of, of businesses I've started in the past. Yeah, no, that's awesome. We touched on it a couple of minutes earlier about um, the Nearbound book, uh, The Rise of the Who Economy, as I did a, a teardown for Jared and working with the team at Nearbound. Um, one element that you quoted in the book, Justin, is um, about the association um, of, sh uh, you know, shared customer service, and if it calls it that. Um, mm -hmm. And there's a, an awesome quote in there where you had over 3,000 Marketo installations as a partner with a, a Adobe Marketo. Yep. Um, some some testament and textbook example to that shared customer service. Tell us a little bit more about that and how, you know, that got involved with Nearbound and, 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 and you know, the Nearbound overlay and things like that. Yeah. So, I mean, a, another like pure origin story, right? Like I, I started a company called LeadMD, which is a professional services consultancy focused on initially marketing automation and then just the entire go to market spectrum. Um, but we started that literally from scratch. Like it's not like mo most agencies kind of get spun out of, you know, a big customer, which is oftentimes like where the founder used to work or, or one of the relationships the founder used to have. Like I had none of those starting LeadMD. And so like we knew Marketo as an organization and, and their platform is going to be central to our own growth trajectory and curve. And, you know, so we got involved with them very early, 2009, like literally we yeah. white labeled that platform, which is a, a strange thing to think about in, in terms of the size of Adobe and Marketo these days. But, you know, the thing that really resonated with customers was the the customer service aspect, the, the implementation, onboarding, augment, staff augmentation. Um, because you have to rewind to 2009, 2010, like marketing automation was not a thing. Most people didn't even know what to call this platform. They certainly didn't know how to hire for it. They didn't know what skill sets it took to run it. And so because I had uh, purchased and, and run that platform very early back in 2006 for a uh, uh, startup that I later exited, like I had a great context and window into like, wow, this really requires a diverse skill set range, you know, within pretty much one or, or two people within an organization, like it needs to be fairly centralized. And so I built LeadMD on that concept. And, and early on, we approached Marketo and said, you know, I don't think this is something that you can effectively couple all these elements of marketing with a software implementation. Like you need partners to, to really kind of expand that skill set, that mindset, and, and really enable your customers. And that was, of course, true. And so as we kind of moved along that maturity curve, we, we would partner with them to ultimately like co-sell our services with, with their software. And then it became like, you know, 
it, buying software, unfortunately, is, is fairly seasonal because Salesforce has taught everyone to buy at the end of the quarter and at the end of the year. And so they would go through these big spikes, you know, where, you know, the third month of every quarter was was massive, but then it would come back down to like a normal range. And so they were having a, a big difficulty staffing, you know, their own talent, not only from a, an availability standpoint, but from a, you know, how do we handle these ebbs and flows? And so we made a very strategic proposal to them that, you know, we can handle those ebbs and flows because we have our own organic, you know, go to market and we're, and we're getting demand, you know, uh, naturally, but then we can also help you augment, you know, kind of those, those natural ebbs to the inflows to the business. And so that's what we did. We ultimately uh, delivered, you know, higher NPS ratings than they were delivering internally. And so we kind of proved, you know, just in a very hands-on manner, what we could do. And that scaled up over time to where, you know, at the end of uh, Marketo's run, right before they were acquired by Adobe, like we were doing 30% of their their installs. And then just, of course, a huge amount of work kind of coming off the tail end of that as people wanted more and more in enablement. Yeah, that's an amazing an alignment. And, you know, would you also say at the time, because again, think, go back to 2009, as you say, you know, marketing automation, you got your infusion softs, HubSpot were just out of the gate, you know, things like that. It was very much in its infancy and, you know, Correct. a lot of snake oil around there, as you would say, uh, around that type of stuff. Would you say that LeadMD was punching above its weight, like the reference you made earlier, by going to Marketo and saying, hey, we can do this? Would that be a, 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 a case and example? Uh, I mean, absolutely across the board, like Phil Fernandez and, and an awesome woman named Amy Carino, who unfortunately passed away about a year and a half ago. Like I flew over there and basically just made a nest within their office. Um, and it was early days. So like Marketo obviously was not what it is today, but, yeah. you know, still the act of doing that. And, that, you know, I hired my entire sales team in the Bay Area. Like we embedded ourselves within that organization, even once they had opened the door to us to the point where, you know, the common quote that we heard all the time was, you know, I, I thought you guys just worked for Marketo um, because we were so embedded there and, and, and so intentional and intent on, you know, just being there when when they needed us because we knew that they held the, the key to trust that we needed to get access to those customers. You know, small little organization, which when we started, we started in my spare bedroom, um, is probably not the number one on, on you know, uh, Informatica or Comcast or, or, you know, any of the like massive customers that we had, probably not number one on their list to call. And so we needed that, you know, that that, that trust barrier to be broken down. And, and we did a lot for those, you know, not only AEs, but CSMs. And then of course the, the entire executive level to prove that, that we were worthy of that thrust. Yeah, that's awesome. Congratulations. That's that's and it's a good foundation for yourself as well as you build your experience and you know get confidence to go to that next level. Um, before we transition into a little bit more about in revenue capital, I want to talk about the operator immersive capital and what you do. Um, you know, there's a lot of people out there, and you'll see it all the time, just in certainly being in VC is about oh, I'm successful, me, me, me type of things. But there's losses and, and lessons learned along the way. Whether it's in, in revenue capital, whether it's through your entrepreneurial career, talk to us about your biggest win if it wasn't the Marketo type of thing, although I'm sure that's a, a, a huge one at the time, and uh, some of the biggest lessons that you've learned along the way. I mean, my, my biggest win squarely is is more of an internal one. So like early on within LeadMD, we made the decision to, you know, make every employee within that organization uh, an equity owner. Um, and my goal there was really to, you know, frankly, I mean, it sounds like a bit braggadocious, but like my goal there was to change lives because it, that business stands out amongst all of the others that I've created because it is a people-based business. I mean, you're aware of this, like, you at the end of the day you are selling people and and it's a really difficult job because the better that you do the more people want from you and and the more you know uh difficult projects you get put on and it's a very easy environment to get burned out in and so like the only way i could think of you know which is my mindset early on was to say like how do i combat that like the only way i could think of was making everyone an owner within that organization and making that a fundamental element of our culture like we want entrepreneurial minded individuals that probably want to go out and start, you know, their own thing eventually, or, or are kind of looking for the springboard. And I truly believe, you know, capital is a big portion of that. And if you can bootstrap that, that you know, that, that organization that you found for a period of time, it's just incredibly powerful in terms of retaining ownership and, and, and frankly, just, you know, having the runway to get off the ground. And so, you know, ultimately when we sold that, or so like zooming way out, like over the course of my life, I've made 27 millionaires now at this point, which is vastly, you know, far ahead, like what I am most proud of. 
Um, because that's not just, you know, giving people capital. Like if you look at the people that worked at LeadMD and even other organizations that, that I founded, like they are running their own businesses nowadays. They, they are, so they've started companies, they've taken ideas to market, um, or they vastly transformed their career into a, you know, a EVP, SVP, C-level uh, career. And I think that was probably, you know, one of the most fundamental aspects to doing so in addition to like providing them a direct exposure to like how a business runs like hey you are going to you know uh be the heart and soul behind this project if it succeeds we can get more revenue from them if we profit here's what we're going to do with that profit and so on and so i think just that entire structure and then of course the outcomes of that structure which are are very visible like i talk to all those people you know on a very frequent basis and so i know how it's impacted them and i know ultimately how they impacted me and i think that's a it's been a very fair exchange of value yeah, that's awesome. And some of the things that you tripped up along the way with um, just you know, something that maybe didn't fly. I mean, I used to have an old non-exec. He used to be the he used to be Barnes and Noble and Wix and 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 various FTSE one hundred companies back in the UK. And he says sometimes, Mike, things aren't meant to fly. It doesn't matter what you do. That you know, the propeller and the wings go into the ground and, and things yep. like that. So sh share us, you know, what you feel comfortable with. Share us some um, uh, lessons learned along the way. Well, there, there, there's two big ones. I hinted at one before, which was like the the grand vision for LeadMD was that we were going to resell Marketo under our own banner and wrap services around it, which, you know, probably in hindsight is not the smartest decision when you're going up against like a, a very well-funded venture-backed organization that can afford to be ubiquitous in the market. And so like the reselling of that technology went absolutely nowhere. We spent a lot of time getting off the ground. I made a lot of promises to the Marketo folks that I was unfortunately not able to fulfill. Um, but, you know, a lot of good came out of that, of course, like the services aspect ultimately became the, the, the business. So that's the external, the internal, like, for me, everything ultimately comes down to hiring. Like I believe talent is the most critical factor in the success of an organization. It's the last moat. Um, it, it is the true value. Um, and early on, like I had this misnomer that like all I had to do was hire people that looked and thought like me, like, hey, if I can just clone myself, like I, I will be incredibly successful. And that's probably the worst possible thing to do. I think a lot of founders make that mistake. Um, when I started hiring for my deficiencies, is really when you know my entrepreneurial journey took off, and and, and I would give that as the number one piece of advice to, to anyone who's who's thinking about or, or leading a company. Yeah, that's awesome. And listen, for you guys listening on audio, uh, just rewind that for sixty seconds. That is absolutely gold. You know, don't hire and try and clone. You know, hire for the deficiencies in you, and you know, just the same there is is entrepreneur and career took off from there. So that's absolutely awesome advice. If you want to learn a little bit more about what Justin and his team are doing, head over to inrevenue.capital. So it's inrevenue.capital uh, or connect um, and follow with Justin on LinkedIn. Uh, just search Justin Gray or In Revenue Capital. And you'll pick that up. And again, we'll put the links in the show notes at forceandfrictionpodcast.com. So we, I, I come across a lot of GTM firms. To a degree, we've got one ourselves, a HubSpot agency, a RevOps agency. We've got our own small little family office just in, you know, not at the scale of what you guys are doing. Um, I come across a lot of those type of organizations and, and I come out across a lot of venture capitalists. I've raised money myself back in the UK, um, you know, attempting to take a company through AIM flotations and an IPO and th things like that. And often the, the two don't meet. And when I read your bio and I looked at in revenue, you know, we've got the GTM, we've got the GTM hub, we've got all the experience of you and the team, but yeah, then we've got the money blended together. And this, this word kept coming up, all this phrase, operator immersive capital. And then it's sort of underscored with we're GTM operators. We're also VCs, but we don't operate like VCs, which anybody who's worked the VC in a typical way, or, you know, stereotypical way, will know what that means. Um, and we think that. So tell us, tell, tell the audience a little bit more about the type of organizations you get involved with, how operator immersive capital um, you know, whether it's LP funds, EIRs, et cetera, et cetera, you know, and, and not frankly going enough, far enough. Tell us more about that and that unique positioning that you've got at, in revenue capital, Justin. Yeah, so the, the idea, to, to answer that, I'll rewind a little bit. So the idea for in revenue really came about as I started to get more involved as an LP in, in several different firms. And again, like this offering is not for every founder, but what I found as I was, you know, participating as an investor and also like a very willing advisor within a number of VC firms is that like 
that advisory offering that most capital firms provide and and they kind of center that within you know like you mentioned EIRs or operating centers within their their organization it's great guidance but most organizations fail in how to deploy and execute against that guidance you know even something as fundamental as hiring like VCs do a great job with often talent flow but they don't really step in and normally step in and evaluate, help you evaluate that talent and come with a lot of opinionation around, you know, hey, you're here within your life cycle. This is what the environment that you operate looks like. Here would be the right fit for those items. Here's how we're gonna manage, we're gonna deploy that talent. Like we're gonna refine a sales process, a sales playbook, we're gonna help you with messaging. Like I felt like all of that was really where organizations were feeling the acute pain, not at like, hey, I wish I had a framework for a sales playbook, or I wish I had a, a framework for PLG or ABM or whatever it happens to be. It's that disconnect between the two. And so like that, I, the idea for in revenue started to kind of formulate based on that experience. And the fact that like, even when I was being asked to, to engage with an organization, like it amounted to a response to a founder hand raise. Founder would raise their hand and say like, I'm struggling with this, should we buy X? Hey, is, is PLG right for us or whatever like that, that question was. And then they would go back and I didn't really have visibility into what was happening with that advice. And we'd talk, you know, six months, a year later, and it really hadn't gone anywhere. And I thought, wow, that's just like, that's where the disconnect is. And so, you know, Operator Immersive is our attempt to brand what this motion looks like, because it's not operator, it's not just operator capital, which there are several firms now that have kind of embraced that, that notion that like, hey, we are LPs or operators and we can link you up with them if you need help. Like this is a consorted, intentional methodology and like we are stepping into these businesses at a minimum of 20 hours per week to really help them you know uh, connect those dots in in between like what should we do and how do we do it yeah love it absolutely love it so i think one of the things and the lessons that we see is that you know advice is great uh, guidance is great but the pressure of the day-to-day -day within a, a you know a founder or a yes. founder's team that just with the best intention, miss it. And then, you know, from an, a, a VC perspective, and I saw it's something certainly from our uh, investments that we have, um, is then you start counting lost opportunity costs. Um, you know, you mentioned you go back six months a year. You know, if that's a one or three or five or eight percent uplift that you could have had, it's not just the one, three, five, eight percent uplift that you could have had by executing and, and you know, nailing that. It's the compounded effect at exit time. Is that a three-fold, a five-fold, yep. an eight-fold, a ten-fold? So people say, well, yeah, we lost 200K off that revenue or half a million off that revenue. Okay, but what's that compounded effect at exit time? That you know, What's the real value? And Justin, you'll probably have a better number on those multiples than I would at, at that level, but it's a lot more than the original lost opportunity cost of not executing. So, you know, you know, ideas are great, listeners. You know, um, they're, they're essential, but you've got to pick the ones, you've got to have it and have those trusted advisors but you've got to be able to get those tires to get the grip on the blacktop and get it out there and if you don't then it's going to cost you a lot more than the initial lost opportunity that often i find just they don't always see the lost opportunity always because they think oh ha hacking that code or putting that feature in is more important than than dealing with what it is and that's the frustrating part for me and i'm sure you see that as well yeah i mean just typical you know, capital allocation is so rear view focused. It's, you know, what do we do this quarter? What do we do this year? Like if you were able to get, you know, someone who is a, an absolute expert in, you know, selling, let's just say, and, and, and have them sidecar you on that big deal or, you know, have them coach you on how to respond to an objection. Like it's those little things that to your point, then create these massive multipliers, because what if you had won that, that big customer that you lost to the point, like, now we're learning from that organization. We can now tout that to, to other prospects that we're working with. We're forming those relationships. And, and that's why we're so also centric around partnerships and, and kind of partner ecosystems and their establishment. Like that is what truly force multiplies an organization is, you know, not, not hiring, you know, a uh, hundred sales reps, but getting the power of a hundred sales reps when we're only paying for a couple of them. Um, and, and we truly believe that's the power of, of partner ecosystems and what most organizations don't actually uh, focus on for many, many years. Yeah, absolutely. And if you head over to inrevenue.capital, there is actually a section on there, which you've got, like you've got your immersive um, uh, capital section, but you've got the operator partner network as well, the OPN on there, which is yep. an interesting read uh, about the network and the support. Which are all There's people that we've worked with over the years, right? And so it's not just, oh, we hear this person's an expert in XYZ. Like 
oh, we've worked on projects with them. Like we, and we know that they'll get along with you. Like you should talk to this person rather than, you know, this host of like LinkedIn resumes that you're going to get and so on. So I think that's a, a really powerful concept that again is led by relationships. Yeah. And again, you know, rebounding and slingshotting this back into the near bounds. You know, I was speaking to Jay McBain uh, and he was talking about the seat mm -hmm. that your buyer's in and the six other seats. You know, it's that trusted introduction. It's that trusted surrounding that you're doing. So I love that model. Um, tell us a little bit more about, just as we're dropping out of the back end of the podcast here, just in conscious of time for you, um, you we, we, we have a GTM lab and that's something mm -hmm. that people can access whether they do or don't want capital. Um, there is an investment criteria separate on the inrevenue.capital website as well if you're interested in working with Justin or at least open up a conversation with the Justin and his team. But tell us a little bit more about that GTM lab. Is, it, is that just something that you're wrapping around it as a framework? And I know we, we said it, it wasn't that earlier but um you know is that something totally different that uh, listeners can go and investigate yeah it, it kind of separate from the investment is so like fundamentally at in revenue like we pay to work really hard right but like we would run into you know organizations that for whatever reason like either didn't fit our criteria weren't raising money maybe it's just a bootstrap business right but they, they were asking like can we still work with you like would you still be willing to to help us out with x y or z and oftentimes it is that Kind of near bound slash partnership motion mm -hmm. right and so we lit up gtm lab explicitly as a response to those asks and so ultimately it's a, it's a way for us to like stay connected to what we feel are really interesting businesses that for whatever reason um aren't right for the investment arm so it does reverse that that methodology a little bit to where they're actually paying us but we've brought it to market at such a low rate like we've tried to make this like a barrier that any organization can afford because we really do want to work with cool organizations and solve interesting problems. Um, but that that's the reason for, for GTM Lab. And again, it's it's allowed us to, you know, continue to grow and increase our own skill sets by having a, a, a diverse range of, of kind of that client portfolio and so on, even if we're not participating on the investment side. Yeah. The way I see it is it keeps you current in your own mind as well, because the gray matter is working in today as well into some of those, you know, what I call the cufflinks out sleeves rolled up methodologies that, you know, Correct. practical things. That's awesome. Um, people interested in working within revenue capital, um, you got an investment criteria, got to be B2B vertical SaaS, you know, 250K to 1.5 uh, million. You, you see all this investment criteria on the web, and we'll put those in the links. Um, is there anything else that you're looking for? You know, you've got a SaaS or a tech uh, founder listening to this and they're thinking like oh this Justin Gray sounds a cool guy I'll head over to in revenue capital what should they be prepared for when they open up a call or an inquiry with you Justin what are you looking for what should they be expecting well first things first in terms of investment criteria like the number one thing because I, I spent about 18 months like talking to every VC that I could possibly get access to and the number one learning I took from them is that investment criteria when it all comes down to it is BS. Like it is like that, that that's what we would like an, an organization to have. But if anyone falls in love with something, they're going to make an investment in it. So like, there's always that caveat, but I think the biggest area that we focus on, cause we're, you know, we're pretty much an atypical VC firm from, from start to finish. Like we don't lead deals. We always partner with a, a lead VC. Like that is our own go to market strategy and how we get access to great deal flow, you know, as an organization that's only a year and a half into its own kind of maturity curve. Um, but, and, and the reason I bring that up is, you know, VCs have a very standard kind of diligence process, which, you know, we look at all those same aspects as well. Although like what we really augment and, and double down on is that what we call founder fit. Um, and we back that up with our own research, like what we think are the, the main indicators that really, you know, drive success when we're engaged with a founder. And so like founder fit is, is where we tend to diligence most of our, uh, our time and is absolutely the key to success in terms of like applying our model and getting value on the founder side as well. Like someone has to really deeply want this offering and it can't just be lip service for the purpose of, of getting investment. Like this is something we're going to work with on a daily basis, like literally daily basis. Um, and so that the, the ability to, to do so is just so hypercritical. Yeah, it's amazing. Amazing. Thank you so much for the insights to that. I really, really appreciate it. it it's great to see that focus and that found the fit really being important so you know guys take a look at the in revenue.capital website um as we you gave a pro tip earlier about you know you know having complementary skills i think that's a, a number one takeaway but what i'd just love you to do is if somebody sat out there right now 
um, the, the the maybe look at your investment criteria, the founder fit is, is yet to be to be established. But um, what's the number one thing they can do? Prepared, you know, are, are you wanting blank canvases? You know, what's the number one thing that people looking to raise money and go to market? What would you expect them to have ready uh, so they could be taken seriously, have a meaningful conversation that's worth you investing your time? Um, what sort of tips could you give them around that? Yeah, I mean, I think the biggest thing by far is being prepared for that conversation, which for me looks like talking to as many other VCs, as many other folks that have gone through that process, founders that have been successful. Like, I just see that, you know, there tends to be this like lead curtain of like, oh, I'm establishing this great pitch deck and I, I, I'm i going to roll it out cold to, you know, to, to, to this ultimate investor. And like the folks that really take the time to be intentional and do the stuff that we've been talking about here, right? Like just forming relationships with people that have done what you want to do, bouncing that information off of them and really dialing it in is, is, is hypercritical. I think specifically for our firm, it's all about go to market and revenue. Like how have you tapped into you know, a uh, unique acquisition channels. How are those repeatable? Do you have ACV consistency, right? Like we're looking for, you know, do you have the beginnings and the, and the foundations of go-to-market engine that we can then double down on? Um, and, you know, have, are, are you partner-minded and so far? But I think the biggest thing is, is, is it happens far before that, which is just preparing yourself for that conversation and ensuring that like you're comfortable and you've got everything, you know, there on, on those slides and in your brain that, that you know we're typically going to ask or any vc is is probably going to ask yeah and uh, on linkedin you may have seen uh, a guy called chris topman he has some great slides and visual infographics that shows you what should be on you know which funders are looking for what type of things and this yep. is great research so do your research and make sure you pitch to a funder that's absolutely interested in that sector and, and i don't know just yeah make sure that you yeah Make sure that you've looked at their criteria. Like I do get a lot of B two C stuff, and it's like I can't be more explicit with the fact that we're B two B vertical SaaS, right? Like it, it just comes off as like, hey, we'll take all comers, and yeah, like that's that's crazy. no good for anyone. Yeah, no, that's it. Last question from me, and this is one from me to you. How do you see the you know obviously the the end of the VC market and the not easy money, Justin, but the free or easy money. You know, we, we talked about capital efficient growth as opposed to growth at all costs is a big lot of buzzwords at the moment. What do you see as the future of, you know, fundraising and VC over the next 12, 18, 24 months? Is it going to be very much similar or is there going to be some, you know, left field things that's going to come in that should people should be aware of? Um, how do you see what, you know, if you had your crystal ball, you know, what do you see is going to happen in the in the near future? Yeah, I mean, you're always going to have your hype outliers, right? Like, I don't need to contribute to the AI diatribe. Like, is, is it a, a, a fundamental disruptor? Absolutely. And like, there are going to be like foundational companies that that are created, you know, on the back of that wave. But for most organizations, it's about building a strong fundamental business. Like we we got away from that for, you know, I'd argue a decade and a half. Uh, like you have to, like what we're looking for is is a, a founder that's pragmatic, that that can be efficient in their capital. They know when to spend, they know when not to spend. Um, and, and ultimately like they they know that a business that is not profitable is half a business. And so like, yeah, you're probably not going to get there in a venture backed organization in two to three years, but like, is that on your ultimate roadmap or is it just, you know, that, that, you know, hyper growth, hyper scale at all costs. I think we've just gone back to a, a fundamental business mentality that was, you know, uh, desperately lacking. Um, and, and frankly, I, I love to see that. So I think if you can, if you've got a, an actual business model that, that, uh, uh, you know, you can make, a case for spending money, you also know that it's not the first lever to pull. Um, it, it is just, you know, you'll be successful within this environment and probably what it will continue to be this environment for another, you know, at least 18, 24 months. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you. If you want to learn more, as a head over to inrevenue.capital, uh, uh, check out uh, Justin on LinkedIn, um, Justin Gray. We'll put the links in the show notes at forceandfrictionpodcast.com. Um, Justin, it's been an absolute pleasure hosting you as part of the Nearbound series. Thank you so much for your contribution. It's been awesome. Thank you, Mike. Appreciate it. Yeah. And for you, we appreciate you guys have got a lot of choice in the podcast market. Thanks for listening to us. We appreciate you being part of the GTM and Revox Life. As I said, we'll post all the links on uh, forceandfrictionpodcast.com uh, where you'll be able to also watch this interview with myself and Justin. Have a great week, guys, and we'll catch up with you on the next episode.
Thanks for listening to the Force and Friction podcast, produced by the 1630 Digital Team. To find out more and access the resources discussed in this podcast episode, visit forceandfrictionpodcast.com. Thanks for listening, and we look forward to catching up with you in our next episode. This podcast and associated supporting content is published under copyright to 1630 Digital. All rights are reserved and no reproduction is permitted.